The Lemurian Epoch is the third epoch of the Earth, or the third developmental phase of the Earth. You have probably heard of this epoch because the Lemurian era marks the beginning of the human form as we know it. During the Lemurian Epoch, human beings move from a more etheric form to a more dense physical form. In prior epochs, the human form was more of a nebulous egg shape. So the ancient Lemurians and the Lemurian Epoch is the first developmental stage that we can directly relate to. We see the human form clearly materializing and many of our internal systems finally developing. In the Lemurian Epoch, we see the human body split from an androgynous form into two different sexes. This is the first time we see the masculine and feminine impulse directly expressed in the human form on the planet. The splitting of the sexes into two different bodies allowed specific qualities to develop within humanity that were not possible in an androgynous form. Thus, from Lemuria onward, two different core streams of humanity take root. The masculine stream and the masculine form, and the feminine stream and the feminine form. The division of the sexes was a natural part of human evolution, and even occurred to a lesser degree in earlier epochs. For example, in the Hyperborean Epoch, some human beings developed to a stage where some could be fertilized, while others could not be fertilized. The forms that could not receive fertilization eventually became the male bodies in the Lemurian Epoch. Thus, even when the forms were androgynous in the Hyperborean Age, they were still embodying and expressing either a masculine or feminine impulse. As the planet becomes more dense, polarity deepens, and the sexes become more obvious, more physicalized. Spiritually, the male form is expressing a positive charge, and the female form is expressing a negative charge. This means that each gender is embodying a cosmic truth, or universal reality. Further, each male and female body is expressing and tapping into its specific wisdom. The male body contains the ancient wisdom and collective experience of the masculine consciousness, the positive charge. The female body contains the primordial wisdom and collective experience of the feminine force in creation, the negative charge. Both the male and female bodies have specific organs, instincts, and abilities that are direct expressions of their polarity. While the physical body can be altered, the polarity or the spiritual reality of one's body cannot be changed. In the Lemurian Epoch of Development, not all forms are able to split properly into two different sexes. Some forms do not develop their sexual organs and are unable to fully embody the impulse or the task of the Epoch. This means that some soul essences were unable to influence their form into a specific polarity or sex. At this time, the soul essence was not fully in the body, but hovering outside the body and able to shape it by sending impulses. Thus, during the Lemurian Epoch, some forms were male or female, while others did not develop functioning reproductive organs at all. In this way, creating a male or female form was part of the task of the Lemurian Epoch for the souls incarnating. The forms that could not develop did not survive into the next age. When the gender split into male and female in the Lemurian Epoch, a spiritual shift or split also occurred in the developing energy body of the human being. Part of the soul's essence as an androgen would not be able to fully incarnate into the physical form, but would instead surround it in the etheric body. For example, when a soul essence would incarnate into a male form, the soul's female aspect would not enter the male form, but instead animate the etheric body. So, the etheric body of all males is feminine. The same occurs when a soul enters the female body. 
its male aspect concentrates in her etheric body. So every male has a female etheric body or negatively charged etheric body. And every female has a male or positively charged etheric body. As mentioned, no amount of physical modification can change your spiritual polarity. The energetic reality of the form is immovable. Going deeper, we can see that the female body represents a negative charge and her etheric body a positive charge. In turn, the male body represents a positive charge and his etheric body is a negative charge. This creates a spiritual chain of positive and negative charges or reactions, allowing the individual to connect with higher worlds and experience spiritual transmutation. Part of spiritual development is understanding the power of your body, which lies in its innate polarity or its natural sex. If we do not understand this, it can become hard to connect spiritually as we must begin by working with our natural polarity or our natural sex. Humans will not overcome sex or the polarity of form until they transcend material reality. Much of the human form in those ancient times described in the preceding chapters differed from the form of present-day man. One comes to conditions still more dissimilar if one goes even further back in the history of mankind. For only in the course of time did the forms of man and woman develop from an older, basic form in which human beings were neither one or the other, but rather were both at once. He who wants to form an idea of these enormously distant periods of the past must, however, liberate himself completely from the habitual conceptions taken from what man sees around him. The times to which we now look back lie somewhere before the middle of the epoch, which in the preceding passages was designated as the Lemurian Epoch. At that time, the human body still consisted of soft and malleable materials. The other forms of the earth were also still soft and malleable. As opposed to its later hardened condition, earth was still in a welling, more fluid one. As the human soul at the time embodied itself in matter, it could adapt this matter to itself in a much greater degree than later. That the soul takes on the male or female body is due to the fact that the development of external terrestrial nature forces the one or the other upon it. While the material substances had not yet become rigid, the soul could force these substances to obey its own laws. It made of the body an impression of its own nature. But when it became denser, the soul had to submit to the laws impressed upon this matter by external terrestrial nature. As long as the soul could still control matter, it formed its body as neither male nor female, but instead gave it qualities which embraced both at the same time. For the soul is simultaneously male and female. It carries these two natures in itself. Its male element is related to what is called the will. Its female element to what is called imagination. The external formation of earth resulted in that the body assumed a one-sided form. The male body has taken a form which is conditioned by the element of will. The female body, on the other hand, bears the stamp of imagination. Thus, it comes about that the two-sexed male-female soul inhabits a single-sexed male or female body. 
In the course of development, the body had taken a form determined by the external terrestrial forces, so that it was no longer possible for the soul to pour its whole inner energy into this body. The soul had to retain something of this energy within itself and could let only a part of it flow into the physical body. If one continues with the Akasha Chronicle, the following becomes apparent. In an ancient period, human forms appear before us which are soft, malleable, and quite different from later ones. They still carry the nature of man and woman within themselves to an equal degree. In the course of time, the material substances become denser. The human body appears in two forms, one of which begins to resemble the subsequent shape of man and the other that of woman. When this difference had not yet appeared, every human being could produce another human being out of himself. Impregnation was not an external process, but something which took place inside of the human body itself. By becoming male or female, the body lost this possibility of self-impregnation. It had to act together with another body in order to produce a new human being. The division into sexes takes place when the earth enters a certain stage of its densification. The density of matter inhibits a portion of the force of reproduction. That portion of this force, which is still active, needs external complementation through the opposite force of another human being. The soul, however, must retain a portion of its earlier energy within itself, in man as well as in woman. It cannot use this portion in the physical external world. This portion of energy is now directed towards the interior of man. It cannot emerge towards the exterior. Therefore, it is freed for inner organs. Here, an important point in the development of mankind appears. Previously, that which is called spirit, the faculty of thought, could not find a place in man, for this faculty would have found no organs for exercising its functions. The soul had employed all its energy towards the exterior in order to build up the body. But now, the energy of the soul which finds no external employment, no external embodiment, can become associated with the spiritual energy. And through this association, those organs are developed in the body, which later make of man a thinking being. Thus, man could use a portion of the energy, which was previously employed for the production of beings like himself, in order to perfect his own nature. The force by which mankind forms a thinking brain for itself is the same by which man impregnated himself in ancient times. The price of thought is single sexedness. By no longer impregnating themselves, but rather by impregnating each other, Human beings can turn a part of their productive energy within, and so become thinking creatures. Thus, the male and female body each represent an imperfect external embodiment of the soul, but thereby they become more perfect inwardly. This transformation of man takes place very slowly and gradually, little by little, the younger, single-sexed male or female forms appear beside the old, double-sexed ones. It is again a kind of fertilization which takes place in man when he becomes a creature endowed with spirit. The inner organs which can be built up by the surplus of soul energy are fructified by the spirit. In itself, the soul is two-sided, male and female. In ancient times, it also formed its own body on this basis. 
Later, it can form its body only in such a way that for the external, it acts together with another body. Thereby, the soul itself receives the capacity to act together with the spirit. For the external, man is henceforward fertilized from the outside. For the internal, from the inside, through the spirit. One can say that the male body now has a female soul. The female body has a male soul. This inner one-sidedness of man is compensated by fertilization through the spirit. The one-sidedness is abolished. Both the male soul in the female body and the female soul in the male body again become double-sexed, through the fructification by the spirit. Thus man and woman are different in their external form. Internally, their spiritual one-sidedness is rounded out to a harmonious whole. Internally, spirit and soul are fused into one unit. Upon the male soul in woman, the action of the spirit is female, and thus renders it male-female. Upon the female soul in man, the action of the spirit is male, and thus renders it male-female also. The double-sexedness of man has retired from the external world, where it existed in the pre-Lemurian period, into his interior. One can see that the higher, inner essence of a human being has nothing to do with man or woman. The inner equality, however, does result from a male soul in women and correspondingly a female soul in man. The union with the spirit finally brings about the equality. But the fact that before the establishment of this equality there exists a difference involves a secret of the human nature. The understanding of this secret is of great significance for all mystery science. It is the key to important enigmas of life. For the present are not permitted to lift the veil which is spread over this secret. Thus, physical man has developed from double sexedness to single-sexedness, to the separation into male and female. In this way, man becomes a spiritual being of the kind which he is now. In the anthroposophical recollection of Lemuria, we see the distinct development of the feminine and masculine forces in the human being. For example, the male Lemurians develop a kind of exoteric intelligence, learning how to use their will to command nature and directly influence the physical world around them. The females develop another kind of intelligence, which is esoteric or inward in nature and rooted in imagination. The males naturally develop an understanding of the external world, and the females naturally develop a deeper connection with the soul and the inner world. Thus, the woman becomes a link to the higher worlds, and the male forces seek to materialize beauty and truth of the higher worlds upon earth through their will. These qualities are the human expression of the positive and negative polarities, or the male and female polarities embodied.
In the Lemurian Epoch, we see the first emergence of gender as the male and female body materialize on the planet. The male and female forms are completely different, yet complementary. The male allows for the soul to explore the masculine consciousness of the cosmos, or the positive aspect of creation. And the female form allows the soul to deeply explore the feminine aspect of consciousness, or the negative aspect of creation. With this deep level of embodiment now available, different capacities and qualities emerge. The males naturally have certain inclinations and perspectives as part of their very essence, as do the females. This is because the body itself has an intelligence and a wisdom that the soul taps into. And when a soul enters the form, it is able to experience that wisdom and perspective. According to Anthroposophy, a pattern was developed in the Lemurian Epoch where at its peak, development, both male and females work together in leading the community. The most exalted women played a social role, the role of the oracle, the one who lifts the veils and brings the higher worlds here. The oracle, or the exalted feminine, keeps the earth, or the lower world, in contact with the higher worlds. Thus, some women at this time had become very developed and had cultivated intense abilities that allowed them to commune with the higher worlds. Their physical female body, especially their womb and limbic system, was key. Through rhythm, song, and dance, these holy women were able to rise up and pierce the veil that separated all creatures of the earth from the heavens. The whole environment would change, and for a time the highest beings would teach and reveal the mysteries of life to those in attendance. In the building and wailing of ecstatic forces, all in her presence were drawn up out of the material plane and into the forgotten kingdoms of the soul. In those moments we could all remember that we were divine, and through those ceremonies humanity drew the strength and inspiration to transcend the dull lies of materiality. Pythia, the Oracle of Delphi, the Temple Queen are all daughters of the great oracles that rose in the Lemurian times. The traditions of mediumship, trance, religion itself, and ceremony all date back to these holy daughters of the sun and their extraordinary capacities. Through them, God was known and obvious. Through them, all that were thirsty drank. Through them, the hard and cold earth became beautiful again. And it was Lemuria, the era of the moon and of Venus, that this tradition began. The above mentioned leaders caused the group to divide itself into smaller groups. They put women in charge of ordering and establishing these groups. Through her memory, women had acquired the capacity to make the experiences and adventures of the past useful for the future. What had proved helpful yesterday, she used today and realized that it would also be useful tomorrow. These institutions for communal life therefore emanated from her. Under her influence, the concepts of, quote, good and evil developed. Through her thoughtful life, she acquired an understanding for nature. Out of the observation of nature, those ideas developed in her according to which she directed the actions of men. The leaders had arranged things in such a way that through the soul of woman, the willful nature, the vigorous strength of man, was ennobled and refined. Of course, one must represent all this to oneself as childish beginnings. 
The words of our language all too easily call up ideas which are taken from the life of the present. By way of the awakened soul life of the women, the leaders first develop the soul life of the men. In the colony we have described, the influence of the women was therefore very great. One had to go to them for advice when one wanted to interpret the signs of nature. The whole manner of the soul life, however, is still dominated by the hidden human soul forces. One does not describe the matter quite exactly, but fairly closely, if one speaks of a somnambulistic contemplating among these women. In certain higher dreams, the secrets of nature were divulged to them, and they received the impulses for their actions. Everything was animated for them and showed itself to them in soul powers and apparitions. They abandoned themselves to the mysterious weaving of their soul forces. That which impelled them to their actions were inner voices, or what plants, animals, stones, wind, and clouds, the whispering of the trees, and so on, told them. From this state of the soul originated that which one can call human religion. The spiritual in nature and in human life gradually came to be venerated and worshipped. Some women attained special preeminence because out of special, mysterious depths, they could interpret what the world contained. Thus, it could come to pass among such women that that which lived within them could transpose itself into a kind of natural language. For the beginning of language lies in something which is similar to song. The energy of thought was transformed into audible sound. The inner rhythm of nature sounded from the lips of wise women. Once gathered around such women and in their song-like sentences felt the utterances of higher powers. Human worship of the gods began with such things. For that period, there can be no question of sense in that which was spoken. Sound, tone, and rhythm were perceived. One did not imagine anything along with these, but absorbed in the sole power of what was heard. The whole process was under the direction of higher leaders. They had inspired the wise priestesses with tones and rhythms in a manner which cannot now be further discussed. Thus, they could have an ennobling effect on the souls of men. One can say that in this way the true life of the soul first awakened. In this realm, beautiful scenes are shown by the Akasha Chronicle. One of these will be described. We are in a forest near a mighty tree. The sun has just risen in the east. The palm-like tree from which all other trees have been removed casts mighty shadows. The priestess, her face turned to the east, ecstatic, sits on a seat made of rare natural objects and plants. Slowly in rhythmical sequence, a few strange, constantly repeated sounds stream from her lips. A number of men and women are sitting in close circles around her, their faces lost in dreams, absorbing inner life from what they hear. Other scenes can too be seen at a similarly arranged place. A priestess sings in a similar manner. But her tones have in them something mightier, more powerful. Those around her move in rhythmic dances, for this was the other way in which soul entered into mankind. The mysterious rhythms which one had heard from nature were imitated by the movements of their limbs. One thereby felt at one with nature and with the powers acting in her.
Humanity in the Lemurian Epoch was centered in an island on the Pacific Ocean. This was the first time our development is not centered at the poles. At this time, the Earth is sinking deeper and deeper into material form, which causes a more intense experience of polarity. We see greater shifts in temperature, and more distinct seasons emerge. Though the planet is still very temperate, by today's standards. The Lemurian phase of development was turbulent, with intense lava flows and volcanic eruptions. Humanity was gigantic compared to our size today, and the ground was marsh-like and not nearly as solid as today. Many researchers place Lemuria and Atlantis as parallel cultures. This is technically not the case. The Lemurian Epoch is a different era of development than the Atlantean Epoch. The Atlantean cultures evolved out of the Lemurian impulse, thus Atlantis is an evolution of Lemuria. That said, while the Atlantean impulse was shaping humanity, there were still individuals that carried a certain Lemurian essence. These individuals were called Lemurians, and remained associated with that culture. Thus, the Lemurian civilization did not technically overlap with Atlantis, but certain groups carried more of the Lemurian impulse and carried on during the Atlantean Epoch. The Lemurians had quite a different capacity than present-day humanity. They didn't have the ability to think logically, However, they did have the capacity to create images of their experiences. They just could not preserve those images in their mind as a memory. Memory and what we would consider the basis of our human mind today did not truly begin to take place until the next epoch, the Atlantean epoch. The Lemurians developed buildings and even a civilization. However, all that they created was from a kind of spiritual instinct. Thus, the Lemurian consciousness was rather dreamlike, interwoven with nature, and there was no sense of individuality. The Lemurian Epoch is also defined by the malleability of the human form and the Earth. At this time, the form was easily shifted in its general appearance by impulses that the soul would send to the body, and also the body would adapt to the environment that it was in. Rocks and minerals were also much more malleable and had not become as rigid and dense as today. Animals and plants also had the incredible ability to adapt, and some advanced groups learned how to specifically cultivate plants and animals for certain tasks. The human form and mineral kingdom do not completely materialize until later in the Atlantean Epoch. Thus, the Lemurian Earth stage was one of direct permeability between man and nature. Many of the images of chimeras, or half-human, half-animal beings, relate back to the Lemurian Epoch, when humanity had not yet taken its final form as we know it today. In the Lemurian Epoch, the human form could shift according to different higher influences. According to Rudolf Steiner, the Lemurian human form at one point consisted of four archetypal shapes, that of the bird, the lion, the bull, and the serpent. During this time, the head of man resembled a bird, the chest, a lion, the lower torso a bull, and the lowest half was reptilian. Or serpentine. This is because man at the time was embodying these four cardinal celestial forces. Part of humanity manifesting the physical body we have today involved the casting out of lower devolved spiritual aspects that were trying to enter the form during the Lemurian Epoch. This means that various kinds of soul essences were trying to manifest themselves into the human body during the time of Lemuria. Because the human body was not quite solidified at this time, it was possible for divergent spiritual essences that had fallen behind in earlier periods of development to try to enter the life wave of the Earth 
through attaching to the human body. When a fallen soul essence would attach to the body, the body would take on its appearance. Spiritual attachment still happens today, though it does not immediately alter our appearance as it once did in Lemuria. The divergent soul essences that tried to enter the body in the Lemurian Epoch had to be cast out. This casting off or separating of the fallen soul essences from the developing human body was guided by spiritual leaders from the spiritual hierarchies. They did this because humanity needed to develop a form that was an exact microcosm of the macrocosm, or a direct embodiment of the cosmos, a direct embodiment of God. If this perfect human body template was not achieved in Lemuria, humanity would not be able to evolve properly in future epochs. Thus, during the Lemurian epoch, there was a great battle between dark and light forces over the proper development of the human form. During the Lemurian period, all animal forms passed through the human before it took its final shape. This progression of form is now seen in the development of the human fetus, where the baby repeats this progression through the animal kingdom up to human. Ultimately, all animal essences, or essences within the animal kingdom, were cast out of the human being during this period, allowing the human form to take its final shape. Keep in mind that these animal forms never fully materialized into human animals or anything of the sort, but instead appeared in the etheric body of humanity and were cast out before the final materialization of the form. The casting out of animal waves from the etheric body of man coincides with the development of animal life on Earth. So, in the Lemurian Epoch, various different kinds of beings were seeking to enter the life wave of humanity through attaching to the developing physical body. Perhaps the most notable was the serpentine essence, or what many modern-day mystics call the reptilian form. During the Lemurian Epoch, a reptilian influence was appearing in the human being and manifesting as part of the lower human form where the legs would be. Thus, the human form in Lemuria had a serpentine lower half in its early quasi-physical manifestation. This reptilian element was ultimately cast off. This casting off of the serpent, or the reptilian aspect, that was in the etheric body, allowed the full human form to begin to materialize. This is the original casting out of the serpent from the Garden of Eden, which is the casting out of one's lower nature. The idea that etheric reptilian shapeshifters are attempting to run the world from the lower planes is a popular conspiracy theory. Many people, long before this concept made its way into the conspiratorial Western mind, claimed to see these reptilian beings in dreams and during shamanic journeys. They often had fearful experiences where these lizard-like beings would try to attach to them and at times even possess their bodies and try to live through them. Is it possible? that these etheric reptilian beings are the same beings that were trying to enter the form in Lemuria? Are these beings connected to the serpentine forces that were once cast out of the Lemurian Garden of Eden? The idea of the reptilian shapeshifter seems to have gained popularity right when we are discussing the Lemurian Epoch on this channel. If you have been following my series, Lemuria is exactly when the serpentine element or a reptilian element was cast out of the human etheric body. This week, a woman on an airplane became extremely upset because she felt that there was someone sitting beside her that was not real or inhuman. This caused an uproar on the internet where people began to discuss 
how spiritual forces can attach and possess human beings, especially those who take on a reptilian appearance. Since then, many people have been diving into esoteric concepts in an attempt to uncover exactly what she may have been experiencing. Through the lens of spiritual science, we can break down some of these concepts and perhaps understand why people may, at times, see things that do not appear to be real. Why people may see etheric overlays and what an etheric manifestation really is. We have all heard accounts of reptilian beings prowling the astral plane. We've heard of sensitive people seeing these astral reptilian forms enveloping and overshadowing certain people who seem to be under their influence. This astral serpent entity is often called a shapeshifter, and according to esoteric traditions, is a demonic force that attaches to people to feed on their life force energy. Serpentine beings are often shown as dwelling in the darkness of the underworld with other chimerical creatures that appear to have both human and animal attributes. But does this astral reptilian or serpent form actually date back to the Lemurian Epoch of humanity? Is this a kind of entity that was cast out of the human form and left behind? To evaluate this properly, we need to understand the concept of the doppelganger, the double or the etheric double. The etheric double is a spiritual form that is part of the human being's energy body. This form can take on various appearances according to the consciousness of the individual. At times, one may produce a double that looks exactly like them. And strangely, this double may even be seen by the individual or even other people. How this happens is that the etheric body can arrange itself to project an image of certain essences that are interacting with the human being on the astral plane. In this way, one's etheric body can produce an image of itself or even a menacing force that the individual is dealing with in the astral realm or subconsciously. In other words, what appears as one's etheric double is simply a projection of what is happening with the individual in the astral, or even what is happening to the collective within the astral. So, a double doesn't always have to be an exact mirror of the person. A double can also be created that takes a darker tone. One's double can also manifest as the embodiment of one's greatest fear. Thus, the etheric double is also known as the dweller at the threshold or a terrifying entity that appears before certain spiritual milestones in order to symbolize the shadow within ourself that we must confront. However, there is a deeper mystery to the double, as the etheric double will also contain a characteristic of the age or era that one lives in. So our etheric double is not just a personal reflection, but also a manifestation of the collective, specifically the darker forces that are challenging humanity at this time. Thus, our double manifests to us as a representation of the challenge that we are currently facing, both personally and collectively. It is our shadow self. In this way, these terrifying figures guard us from the experience of higher planes before we are ready, and they also reveal the most hidden parts of our inner world. As humanity at large evolves, it faces collective challenges. In anthroposophy, humanity is coming to face the challenge of Aramon, or Memphistopheles, the spirit of extreme materialism. And 
In turn, our etheric double often takes on an harmonic form. Often a degenerated or deformed human appears in a black robe. Popular culture seems to have tapped into the essence of the harmonic etheric double. Let's return to Lemuria. If Ahriman is a form that we are facing today, what was the etheric form that took shape representing humanity's collective shadow in Lemuria? Well, in the Lemurian epoch, humanity was influenced by a different force, Lucifer. The Lemurian epoch is the era of human history that we know as the Garden of Eden. It is when the male and female form begin to materialize or physicalize, which is the esoteric secret behind Adam and Eve, or the first man and woman on Earth. And, of course, also in Lemuria, we see the fall of Adam and Eve due to Lucifer, who appears to Eve as a serpent. Lucifer manifesting himself to humanity as a serpent instead of a human being is key as it is in this period of human development. Lucifer represents humanity's darkest shadow and the forces within themselves that they must learn to overcome. Lucifer has the power to give humanity wisdom. For this, he is portrayed as the light bearer. But Lucifer himself is underdeveloped because he is not loving or has not evolved yet to understand the importance of love. Thus Lucifer represents pure knowledge without the foundation of love. And knowledge without love is very dangerous. Thus, in Lemuria, the serpent or the reptile is humanity's collective etheric double. It is the seed of the mind and knowledge, but in the most undeveloped and selfish stage. The reptilian human, the serpent in the Garden of Eden, is humanity's shadow self representing this dynamic. Thus the serpent being or the reptilian is the dark etheric double of an earlier stage of humanity. Over this time as humanity evolves, this aspect is cast out and left to roam the lower planes. Perhaps if humanity can redeem Lucifer through loving selfless acts, so too will the astral forms that bear his reptilian image be reconciled. Let's go even deeper. As mentioned in my previous videos on the Maria, the human form itself had a temporary serpentine nature before it settled into the form we have now. You see, in the earlier part of Lemuria, the bottom half of the human form did not have legs. Instead, it had a serpentine or reptilian tail. The human form had not yet materialized and would shift according to different celestial and earthly influences. So, in the Lemurian epoch, the physical form was not solid and the human form would directly reveal the conditions of their etheric body or double. Thus, the astral influences that were interrupting the development of the human being would directly manifest in the human form. This process is explained by Rudolf Steiner in his Recollections of Lemuria and summarized by Giorgio Spagnoli. At first, man is dual. In the head, he resembles a bird, in the chest, a lion, and in the belly, a bull. The lower part of the human body is immersed in water and resembles a serpentine dragon form. As the upper part of man becomes emancipated from the lower reptilian, man becomes erect for the first time. In fact, the eye is now approaching to enter the astral body. 
The two eyes, sun and moon, the heart, due to the effect of the eye, and the lungs, due to the refining of the aerial element, are formed. This is the moment in which marine reptiles, dinosaurs, and pterosaurs appear on the earth, expelled together with the lower reptilian part of the astral body that had taken on the appearance of the luciferic spirits of temptation. The great reptiles of the Mesozoic derive from the shape of the man of the time as warm-blooded reptiles from their upright posture. The lower part of man will then act as a vehicle for the double or shadow, which in fact has a reptilian form. They go on to reveal that reptiles appearing on earth are simply a physical manifestation of this specific spiritual event. Elohim blessed them. Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the waters of the seas. Let the birds multiply on earth. But the gigantic forms and the terrible appearance of these reptiles of the Mesozoic and even the ability of the pterosaurs to fly are under the extreme influence of Lucifer. With the introduction of the astral body and the approach of the eye during the Lemurian Epoch, the reptilian etheric double that represented Lucifer was cast out of the human being. With no earthly body to hold them, did these reptilian human forms begin to roam the shadow world or the eighth sphere, perpetually looking to re-enter the life wave of humanity? Is it possible that to this day, these astral serpent beings are still seeking to reattach to humanity from when they were cast out during the Lemurian Eden? Does this esoteric mystery reveal that the reptilian beings seen by so many are truly a form of the luciferic spirits of temptation who were cast out of the Garden of Eden so long ago? The esoteric history of humanity is full of many secrets and mysteries, including the mystery of the etheric double, Aramon, and Lucifer. Looking back in our past, we see the struggle to manifest our human form and the bitter battle between dark and light forces in the cosmos. We see the forces of light, or the spiritual hierarchies, ultimately casting out the dark, fallen soul essences that clung to the human body so desperately for their own survival. And in the middle of the Lemurian Epoch, we see a main character in this struggle emerge, the serpentine form, or the Luciferian reptilian being. Since that time, the reptilian humanoid has become a fixture in modern spirituality. Their menacing presence acts as a terrifying parasitic force upon humanity. However, now officially cast out of the form and Eden or our Earth, these forms are stuck, disembodied in the lowest plane of existence, still perpetually seeking a body, seeking a form on Earth. The Earth or Eden that they were cast out of so long ago. People who vividly encounter these beings believe they are aliens, and various mythologies about them fill the corners of the New Age and ufology. Immoral people in society, who many accuse of being Luciferian, are allegedly consumed by these astral serpent beings, their body no longer their own and instead seemingly permanently overshadowed by these lower Luciferic serpent beings. You see, deep within our past lies the keys to understanding the shadow world and the parasitic entities that are bound to roam it. Through taking the time to study occult science, we can begin to see the big picture and directly confront the forces that are trapped just outside the earth that are desperately seeking to enter it.
In the Lemurian Epoch, the development of human sense perception progresses. In particular, man spends a period of time as a cyclops. He has one eye in the middle of the forehead and can now sense different degrees of light and darkness. Naturally, a sense of fear emerges in the darkness and feelings of positivity emerge in the light. Later, this eye will retreat into the brain, becoming the third eye, or our pineal gland. Humanity also begins to walk upright, something that not all forms could do in earlier epochs. And with this upright form, the upper and lower portion of man is ruled by different forces. The lower half of man is associated with water, while the upper, fire. The most pivotal event in the Lemurian Epoch for humanity was the ejection of the moon, or the separation of the moon from the earth. In the prior epoch, which was the Hyperborean Epoch, we saw the separation of the sun from the earth, and now in the Lemurian Epoch we see the separation of the moon. While this may seem like a strange concept, in spiritual science, every action in the solar system has not only a physical purpose, but a spiritual one. And the ejection of the moon from a planet happens to stabilize the planet's densification, and also to create a protective membrane around a planet as it begins to sink into its darkest and densest period of development. As the Lemurian Epoch progressed, the Earth became more and more dense. By about midway through the Lemurian Epoch, the Earth's density was compounding so rapidly that it reached a point where the Earth was becoming so dense that many souls could no longer incarnate onto the planet. To remedy this, what we know as the essence of the Moon, which was at the time coexisting as a separate layer of the Earth at this time, was concentrated and ejected. The Moon then took its place as the satellite of the Earth. The spiritual substrate of the Moon forms a separate realm of the Earth and cosmos, which ultimately acts as a protective barrier for the Earth. With the separation of the Moon from the Earth, also came the separation of certain streams of life that had fallen out of the rhythm of creation or out of the natural life wave of the Earth. These streams were competing with the healthy development of the planet by attaching to human beings to the point that it was difficult for them to function and freely develop. So, like how fallen soul essences were trying to hijack the form in Lemuria, they were also trying to get a controlling influence of the planet during this period. The ejection of the moon cast out these beings into a separate realm in which the moon acts as a barrier that they cannot enter the earth nor the human life wave. This moon realm is also known as the abyss, the eighth sphere, or oblivion. The dark entities that were cast out of the earth during this period fell into the abyss, or what in spiritual science is called the eighth sphere. This is a realm where entities in the solar system go when they work against God, and therefore become a danger to creation itself. These fallen entities thus live in a state of imprisonment, quarantined off from the rest of human development. There is no life-giving essence within that realm. Only the presence of death is there. Thus the beings trapped here develop inhuman qualities and a degenerative appearance. They often appear looking like deformed human beings or appear as a chimera. They appear in these particular forms because these soul essences have never made it fully into the human stage of development in the solar system. Specifically, they were never able to enter the human life wave during the Lemurian era of the Earth. While these entities are in a separate realm, it is possible for them to make spiritual contact with humanity. They do this by attempting to telepathically communicate with human beings. When they do this, they will progressively try to not only parasitically attach to the human being, 
but also convince them that they are gods. They then can eventually possess humanity so that human beings do their bidding on earth. Their goal is to open the abyss or the eight sphere so that they are no longer trapped and bound to the forces of darkness and degeneration. They use humanity's pain and fear against them to manipulate them and their ultimate goal is to challenge and ultimately dominate God. When dark practitioners summon demonic entities from the abyss, it is not just so that they can have personal wealth and power. That is only the lowest reason why these beings are contacted. The real reason why these beings are connected to is so that a direct line of connection to the earth and the abyss can be created, or so that entities from the eighth sphere can easily flow into our earth realm. These entities then seek to possess people to further attempt to turn the earth into their domain. And they create movements on earth to create inhuman forms that they can occupy. These forces in the abyss were cast down during the Lemurian period of development before the human being had taken its final form and they ultimately seek to take the human body and the earth once and for all. When we understand the ejection of the moon from the earth, we see that it was a protective act. It happened not only to stabilize the physical development of the earth, but to actually separate the fallen soul essences of very early humanity from the healthy life wave. The moon in this way is the guardian of the earth, the protectress of humanity. She is Artemis with her great bow, ready to strike down any attempts of the unworthy from entering the earth and harming her children. She is the Sphinx whose riddle one must recite in order to pass through her lunar gates. She is an aspect of the Great Mother, and no fallen force that has been cast beneath her feet shall cross her threshold and harm her earthly children. The moon is not a harmful entity, as many people think it is, but rather the protector of our world. The protector of the earth. A popular narrative in ufology and the new age is that the moon is completely artificial. Many people believe that alien beings created the moon and that the moon is a mind control mechanism that emits dangerous and controlling frequencies to the earth. The evidence for this is that the moon appears to have been modified or tampered with in early developmental cycles. In reality, the moon is a natural body and if it has been modified, it has been modified by the fallen entities that seek to escape from its influence. You see, the moon is not a malevolent influence to the earth. The moon is the earth's protection from these lower fallen entities that are trapped behind its influence. It forms a barrier or membrane that separates the earth from the abyss. All efforts to tamper with the moon are therefore to help these entities escape from the abyss. In this series, we have covered many of the key aspects of the Lemurian phase of development, both human and planetary. To summarize, the Lemurian Epoch is the first time we see humanity solidify into a quasi-physical form. Before this period, humanity and the planet was in an etheric and even astral condition. Only in the Lemurian Epoch of human and earthly development does the human form begin to resemble the shape and function our form has today. Due to this quasi-physical state, the human form was more like a shapeshifter that took on both the angelic and animal influences around them. Some influences from the animal kingdom would manifest in the human form as animal parts, and the human being was a natural chimera of these different influences. 
And of course, the human form was also influenced by the angelic hierarchy, which pulled the form into a higher level of refinement. Eventually, the human form had to completely solidify into its final condition and cast out all influences from the animal kingdom and any lower kingdoms of life. Also at this time, the planet was increasing in density and becoming more and more materialized. This environment required the splitting of the androgynous soul into two different sexes, the male sex and the female sex. As density increases, individuation is required. Some soul essences had difficulty splitting themselves into two genders, and thus many Lemurian forms could not fully manifest a male or female body for themselves. So the Lemurian Epoch had some forms that were fully able to split into two distinct genders, and also forms that remained sexless or androgynous. These different forms lived side by side until the Atlantean Epoch, when it finally became required that all soul essences seeking to enter the human life wave on Earth had to be able to incarnate into either a male or female body. Throughout this early period of human development, the angels from within the spiritual hierarchy had to cast out all influences that were trying to parasitically attach to the human form through the animal kingdom as well as fallen angels that were attempting to influence from above. The human form was becoming more and more refined and powerful, and many fallen soul essences wanted to try to enter the human form even though they had not developed spiritually enough to do so. A great battle occurred in heaven and on earth over the direction of the form. Ultimately, the higher angels won out and the fallen angels and lower soul essences were cast into the abyss. Many fallen entities that could not enter the human kingdom at this stage present themselves as part animal, such as Lucifer presenting himself as a serpent, or Luciferic entities presenting themselves as serpent beings or reptilian beings. This is also common in images of demonic beings and also of modern day aliens. The chimerical nature of the form is the typical form of the abyss, of an entity that could not fully become human in earlier stages of development and now seeks to parasitically attach to humanity instead. Lastly, we see the most significant planetary event, which is the ejection of the moon from the Earth, or the separation of the moon from the Earth. The separation of the moon from the Earth was an important part of human and planetary development. At a certain level of development, a planet will produce a moon, and the moon of any planet is a vestige of an earlier period of development on that planet. So in this sense, the separation of a moon from a planet casts out fallen forces of the life wave of the planet that are not developing properly. So there's a very deep spiritual reality of a moon, of our moon. Once the moon and these lower forces are cast out, it creates a separate realm around the planet. This moon realm surrounds the planet as a kind of protective barrier with the physical body of the moon marking the material gateway into the non-physical moon plane. In this way, the moon actually protects the Earth from the fallen forces that exist behind the moon that were cast out in earlier phases of the Earth's development. Although these forces exist in a different realm and were cast out by the angelic hierarchies, 
they can still try to communicate with humanity through spiritual rites and even through thought forms. Many people become influenced by these entities and when this occurs, they seek to destroy the moon or alter it in certain ways. This is to release the fallen entities that are trapped behind the moon's influence. This is the core reason why there is so much misunderstanding and propaganda about our moon. To get to the heart of it, this is the core reason why there is so much misunderstanding and propaganda about our moon. Darker forces would like humanity to think it is completely artificial or even some kind of negative controlling force so that they can get permission to alter it or remove it entirely. Of course, altering the moon or removing the moon only releases the entities from the abyss upon humanity. Thank you everybody for watching. If you enjoy my work, please like, subscribe, share, and comment. If you want to keep this work going, please make a donation. The links are below, or you can also sign up to my website where I offer live Q&As, forums, and lots of really awesome perks.